Okay, class, this is lecture number two, A Continent on the Move. And basically what we're going to be looking at in this lecture is we're going to be looking at uh, the Europeans that came over here uh, with, in North America with much less of a focus on England, but more so on like Spain, uh, the French, as well as the Dutch. And we're also going to talk about uh, what happened uh, to the Native Americans, uh, how they adjusted to this world, and um, kind of what happened in a general overview uh, with the other empires. Okay? So, here we go. A continent on the move. The New Europe and the Transatlantic World. You ready to go to the next slide? Now, of course, the first uh, power that we'll talk about is Spain. And almost as soon as they got over here, they ran into a problem because when they believed it was Asia, Portugal, who had assumed that they had the uh, Asiatic trade routes uh, captured, cried out no fair and went to the Pope. And like two fighting kids who were threatening to go to war, uh, Pope Alexander VI steps in with the Treaty of Tortosalis. The first one was in uh, 18, I mean 1493, but it was further refined in 1494. Basically, he had a line, of, an imaginary line, that was 370 leagues west of the um, Cape Verde Islands. And he said, okay, everything west of that line belongs to Spain, and everything east of that line belongs to Portugal. And the curious problem with this is, um, here's the second line, uh, that just happens to run through a little bit of a South American country. Because remember, none of this had really been explored, and so that's why uh, Portugal got a hold of Brazil, and that's how Portugal got its start with Brazil. Ready to go to the next slide? Now, the Spanish policies for their New World possessions, uh, basically, you have the classic line of the three Gs, God, gold, and glory. Basically, the restless conquistadors and friars came over here to expand Christianity among the Native Americans, expand uh, Spanish land holdings, trade, and the discovery of gold and silver. Because if you're doing God's work, he's going to bless you and that's okay, according to the way they saw things. And remember, you had all that army, all the conquistadors were guys that had fought against the Moors in Spain, and so they were veterans coming over here. Ready to go to the next slide? Now the first guy we'll look at is Columbus. And remember, he always believed that he had been in Asia, even though he made three more voyages over here. He continued to believe that he was in Asia. Well, he had worked out a king, uh, worked out a deal before his voyage that he would get a tenth of all the possessions, brought back all of the riches and everything, brought back to Spain if his trip had been successful. And he asked for a colony. And they gave him one on Hispaniola called La Natividad. And he really didn't do too much to advance Spain's policies of God, gold, and glory. I mean, he was kind to the Native Americans. Uh, he wouldn't force them to, like, mine for gold and silver. Um, and basically, you know, there was an agricultural colony. And as you can guess you're not going to make that much money growing uh, fruit and sending it back to Spain. So Spain became disinterested. And then you had people start whispering in the king's ear 
that Columbus was really keeping all the gold to himself. Kind of like Iago, if you've read uh, Shakespeare's Othello, or uh, somebody you might be uh, more familiar with in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you had Grimer Wormtongue that kept whispering to the king of the writers of Rohan that he was old and weak, and so basically he was able to get to advance the um, wishes of the wizard that he served. And so, you know, they said, hey, he's keeping all the gold for himself. Watch, the next boat that comes in here, there's only going to be bananas on it. And, of course, it would come back, and there would only be bananas on it. And they said, see, that's proof. Well, the king had enough, and basically they arrest him and bring him back to Spain in chains, where he dies on August 19, 1498, totally impoverished. And indeed, his family still has a lawsuit with the royalty of Spain asking to get their royal tenth back. So under Columbus, that whole God, gold, and glory thing, it wasn't advanced too far. Ready to go to the next slide? But into this vacuum is a guy by the name of Hernando Cortez, who basically was a guy of unbridled ambition. And he arrived over here in the New World uh, with this turn in uh, the Spanish policy. For example, he was one of Diego Valdez's aide-de-camps when they were able to conquer Cuba. And as Valdez rose up in power, he took him with him. And in 1518, and of course, this whole time, he's basically abusing his power, he's accepting bribes, he's, but all the time he's whispering nice things to Valdez. And in 1518, an explorer by the name of Juan de Grivala, basically, he starts bringing back that he's heard these myths and rumors about this incredibly wealthy kingdom in the interior of Mexico, just off of where modern-day Veracruz is. That's where he found out about these people. That, of course, were the Aztecs. Ready to go to the next slide? Which is why on February 19th, 1519, early, early, early in the morning, I mean before the sun has even come up, Cortez takes a ship with 600 men and 20, or takes ships with 600 men and 20 horses, and he sails them off to Veracruz to see if he can find out where this wealthy kingdom is. Now, guys, he had absolutely no legitimacy. Nobody told him to go and do this. Well, why did he leave? Well, one of the reasons why he left, specifically on 5th, February 19th, 1519, is because the governor had finally found out about uh, Cortez's skullduggery and had basically issued a warrant for his arrest. And so he was supposed to be arrested later in that afternoon on the 19th, so he took off before they could find him. And, of course, as soon as they land uh, at Veracruz, he orders all of his ships burn up, burn down to the waterline. Now, why do you think he did that? Well, some people think it was that, oh, it was that old, we're going to succeed or die, tr die trying. It wasn't that at all. He was trying to hide the fact of where he was because he didn't want to get arrested. And while he's on the coast for about a week, when all of a sudden emissaries from the Aztecs come to him and they give him gifts of gold, parrot feathers, he's amazed by this. And they take him to into Tenochtitlan which was their capital city, 
And he's amazed by, well, not only he, but his men are amazed by um, the, how clean the city was, how huge the population was, about like the fact that because it had been in a swamp, they had to have floating gardens for their canals. I mean, floating gardens in the canals for their food and flowers. And he also sees that they have a huge, huge army. So if he's going to be fighting against this thing, he's got to figure out how to do it. All right, getting ready to go to the next slide. Now, Montezuma II was the emperor of the Aztecs at the time. And basically, he was a very, very superstitious guy. Because if you've ever seen one of the Aztec calendars, basically it has these cycles or these things called centuries uh, that is their version of a century uh, around the edge. And the rumor, the belief was that every 100 of those cycles, the bigger cycle would be completed. And at that mark of completion, basically the Aztec society would be destroyed. And it would rise up again even better than it was before. Now, they were near the closing of that cycle. And, of course, um, Montezuma believed that Cortez might be some kind of god. Now, why might he have done that? Well, for that, you've got to know a little bit about the Aztec background. Basically, they started up in northern Mexico, even though some people like to say, oh, man, they were in Arizona or New Mexico. No. But they were probably in the Sonora Desert, a northern desert in Mexico, and a guy by the name of Coat, uh, Quetzalcoatl, uh, basically, uh, someone who said he was a messenger of the gods told them that God had spoken to him in a dream and they were supposed to march south until they came across a very specific sign. Now, what's that sign? Well, that sign was an eagle with a snake in its mouth sitting on a cactus. Now, that's a pretty specific sign. So they marched that, they marched, they marched, they marched until they saw that sign. And they were right in the middle of the Valley of Mexico. They were surrounded by these other kingdoms. Well, why did these other kingdoms let the Aztecs where they were? Because guys, where they were was in the middle of a swamp. So they had to struggle to uh, make sure everything survived. Like I told you, that's when they started building the boats to uh, raise their crops in. They had to find places to get fresh water to bring it in. They had to work draining out those swamps. But they were very good warriors. And so these other kingdoms would hire them as mercenaries to fight their battles for them. Well, one king became very dependent on them. Indeed, his army was rather weak. And because he used them so many, it pretty much impoverished his kingdom. And he wanted the Aztecs to fight for him. And the Aztecs said, well, what are you going to give us? And they, he said, oh, well, I'll give you my daughter. Uh, and I'll marry you into the royalty. And for the Aztecs, this is like, oh my gosh, this is what we've always wanted. We're going to be like made men in the mafia. And so they, they go ahead, they fight the battle. And they come back and they say, all right, we did it. Where's, uh, you know, where's your daughter? We want this wedding soon. And the king said, okay. And he gave them their daughter. And they took them back to Tenochtitlan. And the king said, all right, I'll be there in about two weeks. And I'll see, we're going to see the wedding. 
And two weeks later, he goes down there, and, uh, you know, they're in a hut, and um, he says, can I see my daughter yet? And there was a curtain over the doorway, and they said, oh, go, hold on, hold on. You can see her in just a second. This is going to be perfect. And Okay, you can see her now. And they pull back the curtain, and there's his daughter. Kind of, sort of. It's his daughter's skin. Because they had skinned her alive, and there's the prince wearing the skin of his, of basically that king's daughter. And the king is horrified. Now, of course, the Aztecs see it as a wonderfully artful thing. Showing, hey, look, both your daughter and my son are one now. Well, the king uh, is outraged by this. He declares war on the Aztecs. But his guys are not that strong militarily. And the Aztecs totally wipe them out. And then they say, you know, we've done this. Let's go ahead and start wiping these other kingdoms down. We're not, we don't have to be sitting around asking for crumbs like a bunch of dogs at a table when we know that we're able to rule. So they went about conquering town after town. Then, because they were the dominant power, they started going to uh, villages and saying, okay, uh, either you can fight against us or we're going to slaughter your village. So most of the people in little kingdoms would say, okay, well, we'll go ahead and pay you your tithe. And they said, okay, what you're going to do is every year, like let's say they had a lot of pet parrots in that town, they said every year you're going to give us 50 bushels of parrots and 10 people. And basically they said, okay, and you know, these towns would do it because they wanted to be um, not wiped out by the Aztecs. And anyway, they took the people, as some of them they might put into the army, but some of them they would have um, sac they would sacrifice to the gods. Indeed, once a year they'd have the War of the Flowers, where one side was given a white flower, the other side was given a red flower. Basically, they'd be given wooden swords, and the two armies would clash against each other, and um, whichever side won... In other words, subdued more of the other guys, uh, they'd be sacrificed first because the gods loved, liked uh, victory, liked champions. Now, don't don't worry. The side that lost, they got sacrificed as well. But you know, it was always be later because the gods, well, that's kind of like leftovers. And of course, as we're uh, as this goes on and on. It becomes more and more part of society, and now that they're in the, uh, basically nearing the end of the cycle, Montezuma was having a lot of sacrifices to try to please the gods, because he didn't know what was going to go on. Now, uh, Quetzalcoatl, after Tenochtitlan got established, he told the people, he said, all right, guys, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go, but I'll be back. And basically, he went to where modern-day Veracruz is. He got in a boat and sailed away east. And another thing about Quetzalcoatl is, you can see, he has a beard. And so, all of a sudden now, years late, years, hundreds of years afterwards, here come these huge ships that the Aztecs had never seen before. And, you know, some of the guys are wearing this metal armor that they've never seen before. Uh, they've never seen horses before. So some of the Aztecs believe that the rider of the horse and the horse were one. And so he thought, oh my gosh, these guys might be gods. All right, ready to go to the next slide? That's like what I told you about the end of the cycle. There you can see the little pieces that break into the units. Anyway, well, they let the Spanish into the city of Tenochtitlan, And, of course, the Aztecs brought with them all of their diseases. It starts killing off people left and right. And, and uh, Montezuma realizes, you know what? These guys aren't gods. 
So what he does is he calls a huge military parade and he invites the uh, Spaniards. They invite the Spaniards to a huge military parade and the parade stops in the middle and all of a sudden the Aztec warriors attack the conquistadores and basically they uh, tried raising all the uh, drawbridges across the canals so uh, the Spanish had to fight their way out and by the time they got outside of the city there was only 198 Spaniards left and I believe two horses. So they had a lot stacked against them. But <coughs> what they did is they went around to all of the neighboring uh, native tribes and told them, hey, if you guys will go with us instead of the, Sp of the Aztecs, then we're not going to be taking away your people anymore. And you're not going to have to pay as high a tribute. So they get a lot of allies and they're able to go back and using their Native American allies basically conquer the Aztecs giving them access to huge amounts of treasure and of course once they've won and they got all this money all of a sudden Spain's like oh yeah that's totally cool you're our guy Everybody ready for the next slide? And so this basically starts a bunch of gold fever where you have a lot of Spanish explorers come over here believing that they're going to be able to find a whole bunch of gold. You have like Juan Ponce de Leon who was the governor of Puerto Rico that found out that if you work slaves to death, they will die. So he needed more Native American slaves. So he goes and he lands on Florida to try and get some Native Americans there. They fight against him very hard. He's killed. But this leads other Spaniards to begin to believe, hey, why would the Native Americans have fought so hard if they weren't trying to protect their vast stores of gold? Okay, next slide. So the next expedition that takes off is that underneath Alvar Nunez, Cabeza de Vaca? That sounds like a weird name, Cowhead, but actually it was a title that was given of honor because his uh, grandfather had told the kings that he'd show them the secret path, that he'd watch the Moors, and if they took one path, uh, his grandfather would show the king and his generals this other path that they could take to get around the Moors and to show which path the Moors took they used the skull of a cow so the king knew to took the other road and, that's, and he was given the honorary title of cowhead anyway, Alvaro Nunez Cabeza de Vaca was part of a huge expedition of men that was sent into Florida now, of course, when they get to Florida, the captains of the ship tell them, look, you guys got to be back here by August 15th or we're leaving without you. And all the guys said, oh, sure, sure, no problem, no problem. And they marched inland. And, of course, they got into a lot of fights with the Native Americans. And they weren't able to find these vast stores of gold. And their numbers are reduced greatly from thousands down to hundreds. And when they get back to the shore, it's April 16th. They miss the ships by one day. Well, they weren't going to let that stop them. They decided to build rafts and make their way back uh, through the Gulf of Mexico down to uh, Veracruz. And they start going, and they're doing all right. There are 148 guys on these ships. And only problem is it's hurricane season. So a hurricane hits, 
off an uh, island that the Spanish called Malado, or Misfortune, that today we call Galveston. And so the, the uh, RAF's shipwreck on Galveston Island, of that 148 men, now there are only 98 left. They can't find any water. And they get attacked by the Karankawa Indians. That basically reduces their numbers down to just Queso de Vaca and his slave Esteban. And uh, they ask uh, Cabeza de Vaca if he can heal the king's son. Cabeza de Vaca says, sure I can. He stays up all night praying and praying. And in the morning, uh, his son felt better. So he was seen as a healer, a witch doctor, a healer. And so basically, they allowed him to stay with the tribe. He kind of got a lot of honor. And after three and a half years... He said, you know, I miss my guys in Mexico. I'd like to go back to my people. And so they said, okay. And he was released. And he kind of wandered his way back down uh, until finally, as he's close to uh, Mexico City, he's captured. And, of course, he looks like a crazy man. They take him to the viceroy or the ruler of Mexico. And, of course, the ruler of Mexico is like, was there any gold? Was there any gold? And Cabeza de Vaca, not wanting to disappoint the king, says, well, I think we saw some cities that were kind of gold. Uh, basically, he saw uh, Pueblos at sunset. And the viceroy got all excited. And he said, oh, yeah, and they have plates of gold and everything like that. And so the king said, well, well can, will you go with an army to get it back? He says, no, I don't think I will. But people were all excited because they heard that. Then Pizarro was able to get the real last find of big gold when he was able to conquer the, the Incas down in South America. But that didn't kill this Spanish desire. There has to be more rich cities out there. So you have like DeSoto, who goes off to find uh, sources of gold in the, along the uh, Gulf Coast there. And even though he's unable to find it, here's his travels right here. See him going through Florida and all that. Even though he was unable to find any of the big cities, he did find the Mississippi River, even though he was killed battling Indians there. And the remainder of his men made it back to Mexico City. Then you have Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, who was a young guy. He was about 30 years old. Uh, he uh, had married a real rich lady, and he was sure that he was going to find one of these golden cities. So he paid for an expedition, supplying 1,500 men. His own suit of armor was made totally out of silver. And he starts the march north because he's destined to find this. And Esteban, Cabeza de Vaca's slave, said he'll go along as a guide. <coughs> and they get to the, those villages that were supposedly made of gold, and they're nothing but pueblos. And this one guy known as the Turk said, Oh, well what you're looking for you're looking for Kivara. Huh? Oh yeah, it's this real rich city. Well, where is it? Oh well, we gotta go two weeks in the northeast. And so basically they were all excited. They'd march for two weeks up to the northeast and they'd say, Well, where is it? He said, Oh, well, we're not there yet. Now we gotta march uh, one week east. And basically he led them to this little town. That was Kivada. That was nothing more than kind of an Indian flea market. Uh, wasn't really any gold. Coronado is infuriated. He uh, tortures the Turk, kills him, and his men back, go back home in failure. Now, do you think it was kind of crazy that all these Spanish explorers that went through America's southwest and down into South America and Central America... Do you think they were crazy for looking for these golden cities? 
Well, probably not. I mean, do y'all remember when you were a little kid and you'd be with your mom at the supermarket and you'd pass by those machines that had like plastic rings in them or maybe a car or little the fake tattoos or, you know, and oh, you'd look at those things and you'd love them. And so you're about seven and or six and one guy you go by those things and, you know, I don't know why you do it, but you just happen to flip up the coin slot and uh, reach in and you find a quarter. <gasps> oh my gosh, you found money. And guys, for about the next two weeks, at every single coin slot there is, you're in there trying to find that quarter. But uh, usually it doesn't happen. Spain was just kind of caught up in that gold fever as well. Y'all ready to go to the next slide? Now, like I told you, there's Francisco Pizarro, the guy who discovered the Incas and got their wealth, which, of course, is allowing Spain to become one of the uh, wealthiest um, places in Europe. And a guy by the name of Bartolomo de las Casas comes out and he says, you know what, it's not really right that we're enslaving these Native Americans and working them to death because God showed us these people to save them. You know, so um, you can't work the Native Americans to death anymore. Well, because you couldn't do that, what were you going to turn to? Well, Spain decided to turn to slavery of African Americans. to mine the silver and gold that made Spain the richest nation in all of Europe. Okay. Up. There we go. Ready to get on? Now we're finally going to talk about England. Basically, Philip, Elizabeth, and dreams of an English Eden. Now, there were two uh, rulers that were at about the same time. Philip II was put into power in 1556. He was a very driven and complex individual. I mean, he already had become the viceroy, uh, viceroy of the Philippines when he was just 15. Uh, but when he did become king, he became king over a very powerful yet troubled Spain. You can see all of their land right here, including up in the Netherlands. And what what he called what he believed all his problems were from was from the fact that the Protestants were stirring up all this trouble, especially over in Germany, and the people in the Netherlands were starting to rebel against Spanish authority. So he believed that God gave Spain all that wealth, all that money, so they could go and put down the Protestants. And he wanted the title of Holy Roman Emperor, or Defender of the Catholic Faith. Now, the Holy Roman Emperor, everybody who has that title, certainly hasn't been holy. They're not Roman. And most of them aren't emperors. Most of them are kings, like Charlemagne. But that's what he's going to do. He's going to become defender of the Catholic faith. Meanwhile, Elizabeth was pronounced queen of England in 1558. And she had a lot of problems going on as well. Her kingdom was rife with religious conflict because her dad, Henry VIII, had uh, said that we're all going to be um, Anglicans or Church of England now. The economies were very troubled as well. And her claim to the throne was very tenuous because she wasn't even the firstborn daughter. The firstborn daughter was born uh, to Mary. I mean, she was Mary, who basically was the daughter of Philip's sister. 
that King Henry VIII had divorced his first wife. Ready to go to the next slide? Now, of course, because England can't go and fight Spain openly, they have to use covert attacks. So they, like, uh, support the Netherlands with weapons and with money. They use uh, privateers or a bunch of pi pirates, like Sir Francis Drake, that set Spanish colonial cities aflame up and down the Spanish main. And, of course, if you're using pirates, you can say, oh, well, I didn't tell them to do that. They did it by themselves, which pirates do. But if, you're, if you give a pirate a letter of mark, then basically they can come and use your ports to, like, uh, resupply their ships, uh, repair them, and you get a percentage of the money that they captured. Ready to go to the next slide? Now, Philip, he's not unintelligent. He carries on uh, covert attacks himself. For example, Ma uh, Mary uh, was the Queen of Scots. She went up and she married the King of Scotland. He prompted Ireland to revolt. And you had the threat of Catholic Scotland and Catholic France moving up and basically doing a huge pincher movement on England. Ready for the next slide? So then Elizabeth gets a little bit more bold and she decides to start her own colonies in the New World. Why? Because in uh, England, the, they felt that the uh, economy wasn't doing that great because there were too many of the meddling classes. Who were meddling classes? Well, these were the guys that basically lived off of charity and weren't producing wealth for England. So they thought if we provide opportunities or colonies to get these guys out of England, they're going to find new resources that our merchants can bring back that's going to increase the wealth. So she spends all this money on, um, on a colony to get started in the New World, basically over in Newfoundland. And it lands on July 30th, 1583. And once again, remember, uh, Elizabeth is paid for everything these colonials need, all their tools, everything like that. Very expensive. And they get their colony started. They were even able to build a boat. But then all of a sudden, they're no longer in the middle of winter. I mean, they're no longer in the middle of summer. They go into fall. And by winter, it is just too cold so they pick up everything and go back home. So all that money that was spent is totally lost. But Elizabeth isn't going to be stopped at that. And, you know, they got away with starting that colony there. So now she's going to be a little bit bolder. And under Sir Walter Raleigh, they choose a location that is much further south. At Roanoke. That could harass... Spanish shipping, and once again help her to get rid of the, her people, but it would be more of a threat to Spain. And Sir Walter Raleigh goes and starts this colony that's named Roanoke, and he leaves to come back to England. Well, something big happens in England that we're going to discuss on the next slide that prevents him coming back. And when he finally is able to return to Roanoke, basically he finds the whole colony abandoned with just the word Croatan scratched into a tree. You know, all the houses are there. 
Some of the houses still have books in them. Uh, some of the tables were set for supper, but no one was there. Most scholars believe that they went and they uh, intermarried with the Native Americans. But once again, this huge expense that now would have um, possibly provided an outlet for England was just money wasted. Well, why didn't Sir Walter Raleigh come back and resupply the colonials sooner? That's because in England, things had gotten kind of serious. In Spain, you had the problem of wealth, because if you have all this money, now everything's going to cost you more to buy what used to be a lot cheaper. But of course, you didn't have as much money back then. So you have huge inflation. And then, of course, you have the problem of faith because, you know, hey, it's once again, if you are uh, King Philip II, you believe that it's these Protestants, that if you just got rid of these Protestants, that you get rid of your problems. And he believed one of the biggest places the Protestants were was in England. <laughs> and he knew that, like, they had supported and kept alive the revolt in the Netherlands. So he sent up this huge flotilla of ships. I believe there were 188. 88, and like 6,000 men. And basically they were going to sail up. They were going to get to the Thames River. Sail into the Thames. Basically uh, all the men would disembark. And they would take over England. And that was the hope. But didn't quite work out that way. Uh, his ships go up. The English Channel is incredibly stormy and tempestuous, so uh, some of his ships got damaged that uh, way, and there were a few fights with the English Navy that didn't have ships anywhere near as big, but they had a lot of smaller, quick vessels. And on the night before the big battle, where they were going to go up the Thames, a huge storm hit, totally uh, dispersing the ships. And in the morning, they were all out of formation. They didn't have protective fire. And basically, the little rinky-dink English Navy on their small boats was able to rush out there and defeat and damage so many of the uh, Spanish ships of the Armada that they decided to call it quits and to return home. But the only way they had to return home was to go around Scotland and Ireland Indeed, some of the uh, Spanish ships sunk off of Ireland and the sailors uh, went ashore becoming what was to be known as the Black Irish. Y'all know what the Black Irish are? Nothing more than an Irishman with black hair. But basically this broke the power of the Spanish Empire. And as a consequence of this, now the Atlantic is open to other European powers coming over here and starting colonies. Okay, getting ready to go to the next slide. European empires in America. Now, the first of these that we'll talk about, of course, is Spain. And guys, basically, Spain was too large to govern effectively. Its officials were often corrupt. And you had bureaucratic and church interference that was continually messing around with, like, labor and taxes. And so, this was a huge and continual problem. Especially because they set it up as a linear thing where everything fed into Mexico City and then it either went to uh, Veracruz. To be shipped out. 
You ready for the next slide? Now, what was Spanish Tejas like? Well, guys, the realities of life here, guys, Texas used to be so big, the very first capital of Texas, Los Adais, wasn't even in Texas. It was in Louisiana. Basically, a uh, French presidio or fort was seen across the river, and Spain went out there and they set up their own capital right across from them. And guys, basically, remember, you're not supposed to trade with foreigners. You're supposed to keep to yourselves. The French are our enemies. But guys, while no wagons or trade may have crossed the uh, bridge connecting the uh, two during the day, at night, the French were selling their breads and pastries to the Spanish. Uh, you had, like, the daughter of the Spanish uh, commandant Mary, the daughter or the son of the French commandant. You had French priests that were coming over, practicing services, uh, doing ceremonies, uh, doing funerals, because it was so far removed from every other place in the Spanish Empire. Hundreds of miles between us and Mexico City. And the, the governor out at Los Adais would always argue, we don't have enough paper, we don't have enough supplies, etc. And then, of course, even Spain realizes, well, that's a little bit too far uh, away from us. They moved the capital from Los Adais to San Antonio de Bejar. And that's where we get into social statuses. Guys, in Spain... There were, like, more than 80 different social uh, classes that their people fit into. The very top people were the Peninsulares. These were the people that were 100% European, had been born in Spain. Now, if I was a Peninsulare, then I wanted to marry a woman who was a Peninsulare, too. And so I'd marry that woman who was a peninsulare, and if she uh, became pregnant, it was my duty to get her to Spain as quickly as possible so that child could be born in Spain and be a peninsulare. Otherwise, it would be the next class down because it, yeah, may have been the children of peninsulares, but it wasn't born in Spain. And you had tons of classes going down. In the very middle, you had mestizos that were basically a mixture of Native American and European blood. And um, at the very bottom of the stacks were, um, it were um, Native Americans because they were seen as the lowest of the low. And if you ever watch, like, the TV novellas, you kind of see this reflected in that, in that usually the owners uh, or the real rich people in the soap operas, you know, that very European-looking, blonde hair, blue eyes, all that stuff. And the, the ones who look the most Indian are, like, the maids. They're always, oh, mother of Dios, I dropped something. And so that's kind of like what the social stratum was for Spain. And in, Mex in San Antonio, you can check the census records because there was a census every seven years. And, you know, you see when this one soldier first arrived there, he writes down that he's a mestizo. Yet by the very next um, census, same guy, same name. Except now, he is a Peninsular. Now, guys, why in San Antonio were they allowed such flexible uh, mobility in social class? Because, guys, they were on the frontier. There were, you were worrying about your survival, which was much more important than what social class you put into. Or at least that's what we believed here in Tejas. All right, ready for the next one? All 
Les Français. <laughs> now, while the France was the French presence in America, now while Spain was all worried about control in their colonies, France was the exact opposite. They were very laissez-faire. Basically, that means to make of letting go, or government totally hands off. Um, about the one curious thing about this, though, is that they wouldn't let people like the Huguenots in France that desperately wanted to get out of France, kind of like the Puritans in England, France wouldn't let them go. Now, wait a minute, why wouldn't France let these people that wanted to get out of there go? Well, because the way France looked at it, if I can't trust you over here, what makes you think I can trust you over there? So, because almost anybody could go, except for the people that really wanted out, um, if you were doing okay in France, there wasn't really a reason for you to pay to get all the way over to New France to start a career, because you're already doing okay. And if you were impoverished, you didn't have the money to, you didn't have the money which bought you the, afforded you the freedom to do something like that. So the population remained really small until all of a sudden in 1663, France saw how much money they were making off of the fur trade and they really got into, hey guys, it's your patriotic duty to move over to New France and you had more and more people going, basically most of them were men, going over there to become fur trappers, they got a cool Dubois or a heart of the woods, and they'd go out and they'd be fur trappers, marry Native American women. And in 1674, uh, New France became a royal colony. Ready to go to the next slide? Now, French expansion. You had like Joliet and Marquette that had explored the upper branches of the Mississippi River and they came back with tales of, oh my gosh, these uh, Native Americans would be perfect to trade with. They have huge cantaloupes, they've got um, tons of food. And a guy by the name of René Cavalier sur de la Salle heard of this and thought it was a great idea. Now, LaSalle was a guy whose brother was in the clergy, or a priest, and he convinced uh, LaSalle to come over here. LaSalle did. Within his very first year of his arrival, he had already learned 12 Native American languages and kind of had a speaking knowledge of about 42 different dialects, or 24, excuse me. And he set up a trading post, except he would set up his trading post not on the cusp of civilization, but deep into Indian territory, always making sure he had like a waterway to resupply him with goods that he could exchange for the furs. And he made a lot of money doing that. And that, of course, if you've got one thing set up that's making money, then he'd go even further into the interior. Always choosing strategic places. And he heard about the Mississippi River. And he wants to explore it because he knows it would be great for trade. So he goes back to Paris and he talks to the king, King Louis, and he says, oh, you know, King, you know, let me start up a French fort at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And we'll call it Louisiana. He named the Mississippi River La Rive Colbert after the French foreign minister. And the King of France thinks about it and he says, no. Why? Because there was peace with the Spanish and he didn't want to cause any problems. La Salle, of course, is disappointed. And six months later, um, they declare war with uh, Spain. 
And so the king tells him, I don't want you to build it at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Rather, I want you to build it 40 leagues west, which put him here in Texas. Y'all ready for the next slide? The Dutch Enterprise. Well, by the 1630s, the Dutch dominated the African slave trade and had conquered a number of Caribbean islands. They send Henry Hudson to try to find the Northwest Passage. Now, the Northwest Passage basically was, everyone was thinking, guys, there has to be some kind of waterway that actually connects out to Asia. So, in his search for the, um, for the Midwest Passage, he, like, explores a lot of, like, New Jersey, claiming all this land for, um, the Netherlands, he even goes up the Hudson River, which he thinks at first might be a key, and he sees that it's getting shallower and shallower, so he turns around and goes out, and he discovers other places like Hudson Strait, and then he gets into Hudson's Bay, <coughs> thinking that this might be the Northwest Passage, but by this time their cruise has already gone uh, six months longer than expected. His crew is a little bit angry, and when he says, come on, we're going to go exploring, they say, no, I don't think so. And they put him, his son, and about two other loyal crew members into a boat and say, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya, and they head back to the Netherlands. But basically, this uh, the New Netherlands, the colonies that the Netherlands had, um, they attracted a diverse population. They offered patroonships or lordships to any company shareholder who was willing and able to bring 50 colonists at their own expense. Because basically they dreamed of, you know, hey, we're going to have all these feudal kingdoms over here, over here. The only problem with that is, though, if you've got a lot of money, eh, you're not going to spend it on building up a feudal land holding because you're probably doing good in the Netherlands. Ready to go to the next slide? Indians and the European Challenge. <laughs> All right, the Indian frontier in New Spain. Now remember, Indian assistance was crucial for Spain getting their, conquering the Aztecs and getting their foothold over here into the New World. But once they start making all this money, all the friendships and promises are easily forgotten. Indeed, in the 1598 Onate expedition, they executed and enslaved Indians who resisted the Spanish incursion. And even though his excesses led to his removal, some of his company founded Santa Fe in 1609. And of course the rule over the local Native Americans became so draconian that in 1680 there was a Pueblo revolt where basically the uh, Pueblo Indians overthrew Spanish power. 
and Spain wasn't effectively able to come back and reconquer it uh, until 1693. Ready to go to the next slide? What about the Indian world of the southeast? Well, guys, even though the Spanish presence in the region was minor, because basically they moved through it, but the diseases that they left on the Indian population was enormous. So, of course, they had to join into confederacies with other Native American groups, and the biggest one was the Creek Confederacy that balanced the competing, uh, competing demands of European powers, taking advantage of the competition between them. For the safety and preservation of their own uh, confederacy. Ready for the next slide? The Indian world of the Northeast. Well, basically up in the Northeast, you have confederacies form, like the Huron and their allies align themselves with the French. And the Iroquois League, they uh, sided with the English. Well, first with the Dutch, then later on with the English. And what's funny is, is they were really excited about their trade with the Dutch, with like beaver pelts and other fur-bearing animals. So soon they wiped out their own fur supplies, and they pushed to acquire new lands to get the fur-bearing animals there, which of course were by tribes that used to be friends of the Iroquois. And these non-Iroquois tribes that the uh, Iroquois are moving on to and taking their fur bearing animals, they don't resent the Iroquois, they resent the Dutch. Now, why would they do that? Well, I'll just start, like, uh, in high school. Let's say you were really good friends. I'll say it's another guy because I'm a guy. And let's say I was really good friends with Bob. And Bob and I would play basketball, might go see movies, everything like that. It was cool uh, until Darlene. Once again, these are names I'm totally making up. Darlene came along. And now he's spending all his time with her. And he doesn't eat lunch with us anymore. And he's kind of a jerk. I don't blame Bob. I blame Darlene. And that's kind of like what the non-Iroquois Indians were doing. Because the Iroquois used to be cool. Yeah. Ready for the next slide? The new Indian world of the plains. Well, guys, um, out on the plains, there is a revolution going on. Basically, you had forces of climate change, the pressure of shifting populations, new European goods, creating a new culture and economy among the plains and the Plains Indians. Now, before 1400s, the Plains Indians rarely strayed from the rivers that formed the Missouri River drainage system. But you had a great increase of the number of buffalo on the Plains, so some cattle and Indian groups abandoned their agricultural villages in exchange for a mobile hunting lifestyle. And it drew a lot of people into the area that did it. And now, all of a sudden, that Spain is over here, they have horses. And some of the horses escape. They get away. They form their own little herds. And guys, if you can get a horse, you can uh, go. That gives you so much power. Kind of like when you're one day shy of your 16th birthday... Your life totally changes on your 16th birthday. Why? Because you can get a car. 
You have mobility. Guys, exact same thing with the horse for the plains people. Indeed, the success, how successful your tribe was, was uh, dependent on how quickly you were able to adapt to the horse. Like the chair of the Comanche that used to be the kick around kids of the plains, once they got a hold of the uh, horse, they could do so many of it and they became such incredible warriors that they have been seen as some of the best light cavalry of the 18th century. And just like I was talking about, if you have a car, uh, when I uh, was a professor down in San Antonio, there was a barbecue place. Uh, that basically, you know, was kind of down in an inner city college and it paid $7 an hour or seven twenty five, whatever minimum wage was then. <laughs> and that was the price you had to take. Now, if you had a car, you could get in that car and drive it not probably about 13 miles north of there. And instead of making seven bucks an hour, you could make 12. Why? Because it's a different location. They need people to work at that one that was $12 an hour. As opposed to the one that was only paying $7 an hour, they knew they had more, uh, more people that would be willing to take that job there. So you ready to go to the next slide? Conquest and accommodation in a shared world. Vida La Frontera, basically in New Spain. Ranching was always the industry that took place uh, along the very tip of their uh, claims. And the only problem with that is if everybody has cattle, there's not a lot of money in cattle. And there was no real profitable way to take them by ship unless you converted them into tallow, which is kind of like Crisco or shortening. So these guys are always, and they're so far away from the rest of New Spain that they're always looking northward for trade. Do you have guys like Jose de Escandon, who came up here and started towns like uh, Laredo. He started towns like... Um, um, Laredo and Nuevo Laredo are the big ones I'm thinking of, but I know he started a lot of other ones. Um, but basically, the population remained very small, and they were always looking north for trade. Ready to go to the next slide? That's in French Louisiana! <laughs> well, I left out the LaSalle story. Basically, LaSalle and his men here in Texas they all died. Um, the men killed LaSalle. You had some of them try to get back to Canada. I think two guys actually made it. But the rest of them were pretty much killed by Native Americans or exposure. But one guy who was crazy was captured by the Spanish. And this Frenchman totally freaked him out. Uh, he took him to where uh, Fort Saint-Denis which was the name of the French fort here in Texas, was. Uh, they raised it. They keep looking for uh, the French in either um, Texas or over in Florida, leaving that whole big area of Louisiana totally ba uh, unlooked for. So basically France, they start settling it. They get this claim to this huge strategic location right in the middle of the continent. France can't uh, get through to England unless it goes through Louisiana or the English colonies and Dutch colonies unless it goes through France. Uh, the Dutch or the English, they can't get to Spain unless they go through France. They have a huge population of fur-bearing animals. They had alliances with uh, more than 12 million member Choctaw Alliance. And by the way, the French 
would trade guns to the Native Americans. What? They gave the Native Americans guns? Couldn't the Native Americans just use those guns against them? Well, they could have. But uh, France had all the gunpowder. So basically, you know, and they wanted their um, Native American allies to be able to get them more furs that they could take back to um, France and trade for a lot of profit. So everything seemed like it was going great. The only problem is their population continued to remain very small. Because not a lot of Frenchmen were interested and Louisiana was unattractive to uh, a lot of the French farmers. Ready for the next one? The Dutch settlements. Okay, basically, uh, as an alternative to the patroon ships, because they weren't bringing in the numbers that they wanted to bring in, the Dutch West India Company offered to grant attractive land to any free man who was willing to uh, come over here and get it. And so basically, because a lot of the guys didn't have money to get over here, they started what was known as the head right system, where they would sell a contract of seven years labor to uh, the captain of a vessel to take them over here to the New World. Uh, the captain of that vessel would then sell that contract for that one crew, um, passenger's seven years service. Someone would buy it. The guy would have to work off the seven years. Then he'd get the free land. But that did start bringing people in. And that ends the lesson. Now, guys, basically on our next lesson, we're going to be talking about England, uh, the founding of the English mainland colonies. We're going to be talking more in detail about how the English colonies got started over here. All right.